Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to welcome all of you to our gathering. Um, before we begin, I wish to take a moment uh, to acknowledge the loss of one of our colleagues, Father Drew Christensen, who passed away earlier this morning. Uh, Drew was a friend and a colleague and a mentor to so many of us here. His loss will be felt deeply in our community and across our world. He's a dedicated Jesuit priest, a scholar, and advocate. He devoted his life to the study of the Catholic Church and its teachings on ethics. He was a leading voice on issues of human rights, international relations, nuclear disarmament, peaceful relations around the world. He lived his life in service to our human family and in his many roles demonstrated a deep commitment to justice and peace. Here at Georgetown, we were honored to welcome him here eight years ago as a distinguished professor in ethics and human development at our School of Foreign Service and as a senior fellow at our Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. It's been a privilege to share our life here on campus with Drew and to benefit from his faith, his service, and his scholarship and his compassion for our world. Uh, Father Christensen will be deeply missed and his dear friend and our dear colleague, Father David Hollenbach, our Pedro Rupe Distinguished Research Professor, joins us now to offer a prayer of remembrance. David? Let us pray for our friend and colleague, Drew Christensen. God of faithfulness, in your wisdom, you have called your servant Drew from this world. We give you thanks for his many contributions to the church's mission for justice and peace. Welcome Drew into your presence so that he may enjoy eternal light and peace and be raised up in glory with all your saints. We ask this through Christ our Lord Eternal rest grant to him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him, and may he rest in peace. Amen. Thank you very much, David. I now like to formally begin our, our gathering uh, this afternoon, and I want to thank you all for joining us. I wish to express our sincere appreciation to our opening speaker this afternoon, Reverend Dr. John Krasovkis, the Archdeacon of the Ecumenical Patriarch, Patriarchate and Theological Advisor to His All Holiness Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew for his contributions to this timely and important conversation. I also wish to extend my appreciation to Archbishop Boris Gudjak, uh, the Metropolitan Archbishop of Philadelphia of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, a member of the Permanent Synod of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church and head of the Department of External Church Relations. And Archbishop, uh, we're very honored to have you with us and welcome back to Georgetown. We recognize how challenging this period has been for those in our community with ties to Ukraine. Today's convening is that much more important because of the destruction and suffering that we're seeing in this beautiful country. We're reminded of the deep bonds between us and the vital work we can do together to address war and violence that affects so many around the world. As we come together this afternoon, I'd like to recognize our colleagues at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs and the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at Fordham University for their partnership in this event. And I'm deeply grateful to John Borelli, our special assistant, for Interreligious Initiatives, and Tom Banchoff, our Vice President for Global Engagement, Professor in our Department of Government and School of Foreign Service, and Director and Senior Fellow of our Berkeley Center for their work and their efforts to bring us together. In our discussions today, we will explore the landmark social ethos document entitled For the Life of the World Towards a Social Ethos of the Orthodox Church, an Impetus for Ecumenical Collaboration. We'll hear perspectives on the document, its significance, the timing of its issuance, and its approval by the Holy and Sacred Synod of the Ecumenical Patriarchate. We'll, and we will explore what kind of possibilities the document has opened for ecumenical and interreligious dialogue. 
His All Holiness Bartholomew, Archbishop of Constantinople, New Rome, and Ecumenical Patriarch, the 270th successor to St. Andrew the Apostle, who has led more than 300 million Orthodox Christians worldwide for the past three decades, endorsed the document during Lenten season in 2020. Across nine sections, the social ethos document lays out a framework for how we might think how we, how we might think about and how we might address challenges across our global society. It begins with reflections on the institution of faith itself, public practice of religion, and religious identity. And it goes on to address social issues related to family and human life and societal issues such as poverty and economic inequality. It addresses issues with deep and long-standing histories and legacies such as racism and enslavement, the treatment of women and children, and refugees. Among the questions we will seek to explore in today's discussions, how does this landmark document shape the relationship between our Catholic and Orthodox Christian traditions? How does it call us to act as we think about the challenges of war and displacement and uncertainty, especially as we see the destruction and aggression taking place in the war against Ukraine? What is our shared purpose? How can we find new opportunities for ecumenical and interfaith collaboration? When the then newly elected Archbishop of North and South America, His Eminence Arch Archbishop Yakovos, visited with His Holiness Pope John the Twenty-Third in March of 1959, he became the first Greek Orthodox Archbishop and representative of the Ecumenical Patriarch to meet with a Roman Catholic Pope in more than 350 years. Decades later, in 2014, Pope Francis and the Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew celebrated together in Jerusalem the 50th anniversary of another historic meeting between Ecumenical Patriarch Athenogoras and Pope Paul VI. Pope Francis described, and I quote, their fraternal encounter, a new and necessary step on the journey towards the unity to which only the Holy Spirit can lead us, that of communion in legitimate diversity, close quote. Well, in just a moment, we'll have the privilege of hearing reflections from Reverend Dr. John Krasovkis. In addition to serving as Archdeacon of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, and theological advisor to His All Holiness Ecumenical Bar Patriarch Bartholomew. Reverend Krasovgis is a clergyman of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. He served as chair of the Special Commission of Theologians appointed by the Ecumenical Patriarch to draft the document that is the focus of our dialogue this afternoon. He has published three volumes of collected works of the Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, as well as many other books and articles focused on spirituality, theology, and ecology. We had the honor of welcoming him to campus last October when he joined the delegation of the Ecumenical Patriarch as part of his most recent apostolic visit to the United States for a blessing and celebration of our newly renovated Copley Crypt Chapel and its new iconography. At that convening, we also had the honor of welcoming his eminence Cardinal Wilton Gregory, the Archbishop of Washington, to join in our gathering. This was a powerful moment of ecumenical and interreligious connection, which we are so honored to have shared here on our hilltop. So I wish to again offer my deep gratitude to Reverend Krasovgis and to all of our colleagues and distinguished guests who will share their perspectives with us today. I look forward to the discussions that will take place ahead, and I now invite Reverend Chris Savgis to the podium, and thank you. Great to have you. Thank you. You were doing so well. I know. Two out of three times. I thought it was good. Uh, President DeJoya, thank you so much for uh, welcoming us, uh, hosting us in this spectacular library. Um, first of all, I would like to begin by conveying the warm greeting and blessing of His All Holiness, Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, 
who recalls with great fondness his most recent visit to Georgetown University and his exchanges with you, President DeJoya, as well as his encounters with members of the administration, the faculty, and students. His All Holiness asked me expressly to convey his wholehearted gratitude for the organization of this event by the Berkeley Center, dedicated to the document entitled For the Life of the World Toward a Social Ethos of the Orthodox Church, to which the Patriarch himself regularly refers now, most recently on World Autism Awareness Day, just a couple of days ago. Second, I would like to add my own appreciation for the invitation extended to my colleagues on the special commission appointed by the Ecumenical Patriarch. This is actually the first time that five of us have gathered together for a program on the document. Working with such an extraordinary team was nothing less than a privilege, a genuinely collaborative reflection for the life of the world received input from clergy and laity throughout the world, including dozens of Orthodox bishops and scholars. I would also like to express my sincere thanks to the facilitating and respondent scholars from Georgetown and abroad. That our spiritual lives cannot be separated from our social lives is the foundational thinking of our document. Initially commissioned, as the President said, by His All Holiness in 2017 and eventually endorsed by the Holy Synod of the Ecumenical Patriarchate in 2020. It's not an exhaustive document, but it is nonetheless a substantial document outlining the profile of an orthodox social ethos in some 33,000 words or 110 pages. For the life of the world was partly prompted by the Holy and Great Council of the Orthodox Church that was held in 2016, a conciliar assembly of the autocephalous Orthodox churches and the first such council to address issues of our time. In an effort to advance the work of that council, the Patriarch charged a commission comprised not of hierarchs, as in the council, or even exclusively of clergy, but predominantly, actually, of deacons and lay theologians, women and men. And though it was completed before the outbreak of COVID-19 over two years ago, and long before the current invasion of Ukraine by Russia a few weeks ago, the document comprises a sustained and sensitive approach to navigating critical and controversial challenges. It's the first time, for instance, that such a document has been prepared with a view to providing broad parameters on the role of the Orthodox Church and the responsibility of Orthodox Christians in the modern world. So its language around the sexual abuse of children is the strongest, the clearest statement issued in the Orthodox world. Moreover, the document does not hesitate in crisp, frank language to condemn social ills like totalitarianism and corruption, racism and anti-Semitism, as well as war and violence. I think the document is especially significant given the historical background of Orthodox Christianity. The Eastern Church has conventionally been allergic, uh, even aversive to social statements, arguably the result of a struggle to understand its place in the world over long periods of isolation or persecution, particularly in lands behind the Iron Curtain. Of course, the church, and I would dare suggest every church, including evangelical churches in the United States, the church has always grappled with its place and purpose in the world, with responses covering the full spectrum from identifying with the world to isolating from the world. And at the same time, at least speaking from my own tradition, the church has consistently failed to educate its congregations as to how they should respond to critical moments. What became particularly obvious to me during COVID, and painfully so with Russia's current war on Ukraine, was the absence of an articulate social approach, an adequate social ethos, 
capable of illuminating Orthodox leaders and inspiring Orthodox believers, especially on such topics as the relationship between church and state, the distinction between patriotism and nationalism, or the tension between faith and science. So in the case of the global pandemic of COVID, religious leaders were often caught up in protecting medieval convictions from imagined enemies or else in promoting conspiracy theories about global plots against Christianity. And then in the case of Putin's shameless war in Ukraine, religious leaders were paralyzed by the aggression inflicted by Orthodox Christians against Orthodox Christians. This morning, I woke up, I always wake up with some idea. I did some number crunching. We love to do that here in America. And I realized that it's easy for me to fall into some sense of complacency or convenience, maybe, because our patriarch, his all holiness, was immediate and outright in his condemnation of the war in his visit to the uh, refugees in Poland more recently, although some people criticize him for not going quite far enough. But I realized this morning that two out of the four ancient patriarchates in the Orthodox Church still remain silent, Jerusalem and Antioch. I realized this morning that Five out of the 15 autocephalous churches still remain silent, including Serbia and Bulgaria. One of those five, Russia, supports the war, at least defends the war. And so I was thinking if Russia, as it likes to think, as it likes to claim, is in fact the largest, the foremost, the most powerful church in the Orthodox world, then Here's my shame. By far and away, the greater majority of Orthodox, the Orthodox world has yet to condemn this war. And I might go on further, but I have to be careful because I'm a guest here. But if size and power and numbers matter, I'll let my Roman Catholic colleagues decide whether Pope Francis has done enough. When the dissonance, the darkness, and the din of this war subside, the Orthodox Church will have to ask itself some hard questions. It will need to articulate just how it imagines that the words on earth as in heaven in the Lord's Prayer might be translated into social and economic and political terms. How exactly can Orthodox theology, liturgy, and spirituality inform and transform the world that we inhabit? That, I think, is precisely what this new document is all about. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome. And thank you, President DeJoya, and thank you, Reverend Chris Avgis, for those very thoughtful remarks. My name is Kim Daniels, and I'm the co-director of Georgetown's Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life. Uh, I want to welcome all of you to our first panel here today. Um, we're talking about the Orthodox social ethos and Catholic social thought, of course, and right now we're going to compare the Declaration for the Life of the World towards the social ethos of the Orthodox Church and its core themes with the core themes of the Catholic social thought tradition, exploring points of commonality and differences of emphasis. I'm honored to be here with this outstanding group assembled, and I look forward to listening to and learning from them. First, let me introduce them. Father Perry Hamalis is the Cecilia Schneller Mueller Professor of Religion at North Central College. 
Father Hamalas teaches and pursues scholarship in the field of religious ethics and with special interest in the Eastern Orthodox Christian tradition, virtue ethics, and the intersection of religion and public policy. Uh, Aristotle Papa Nicolaou is a professor of theology and the Archbishop Demetrius Chair in Orthodox Theology and Culture at Fordham University. He is the co-founding director of Fordham's Orthodox Christian Studies Center and is a senior fellow at the Emory University Center for the Study of Law and Religion. Reverend David Hollenbach, SJ, is the Pedro Arupe Distinguished Research Professor in the Walsh School of Foreign Service here at Georgetown. He is a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center and an affiliated professor in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies. His teaching and research deal with human rights, religious and ethical responses to humanitarian crises, religion and political life, theology, and the social sciences. So as we get started, Telly, let's begin with you. You had a role in the development of this statement. Um, how did the statement on the orthodox social ethos come about, and what's its historic significance? Well, um, it really came about through the initiative of um, His All Holiness, and together with Father John uh, Chrysavius. And um, there are, um, orthodox churches produce statements. Um, uh, we have this kind of system where we have independent orthodox churches, we don't have uh, a Vatican, we don't have a Pope, we don't have that particular kind of infrastructure. One of the key differences in terms of encyclicals or, because this is encyclical-like, and so maybe we can talk a little bit about the form. Um, and one of the things about Catholic um, uh, social teaching, which was built on many of the encyclicals, there's a kind of a cumulative tradition there, right? There's a sort of a cumulative tradition of Catholic social teaching that has developed really over the past century and a half. And nothing like that really exists within the Orthodox Church. Part of it has to do with history. I mean, the Orthodox you know, have been, uh, were under Ottoman oppression for hundreds of years. So when you're under Ottoman oppression, you don't have the luxury to have sort of the intellectual kind of tradition to sort of build and think about these particular kinds of issues. And uh, so we don't, uh, so there are many historical, perhaps theological reasons, structural reasons why we don't have these particular kinds of statements. However, the, the individual churches, we have these uh, independent, jurisdictionally independent churches with the ecumenical patriarch having this kind of primacy of honor. And within their own local jurisdictions, they do produce statements. They do produce statements. Um, one of the biggest examples, of course, is that the Russian Orthodox Church around 2000, I may be getting the date wrong, produced this social concept document. And since then, they produced other kinds of documents. So I think that there was a need. I mean, there was a felt need to have a kind of a global orthodox statement on these particular kinds of issues, not one that would be a kind of manual. It would not be a do's and don'ts. And that's why it's a social ethos, a social ethos in the sense of really setting a tone. Very much, I think it's very much like what Pope Francis at least trying to do now. He's trying to set a tone within the church. And, uh, and, 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 and it comes from the Ecumenical Patriarch and the initiative and Father John and Father John reaching out to uh, scholars and, and, and bringing people together. Uh, because, I mean, it really is the truth. We don't, we don't have a pope, we don't, but if you're gonna ask, like, if you're gonna really uh, think about where, where is transnational orthodoxy, and especially given what's happened in Ukraine today, the idea of transnational orthodoxy is more important than ever where is transnational orthodoxy symbolized, it's really in the person of the ecumenical patriarch. And so from that point of view, there was a need really to have a kind of document setting a tone coming from the person who really symbolizes global orthodoxy more than any uh, person uh, really in the world. Thanks so much. Perry, you also had a role in the development of this statement. What do you see as its background, its historic significance? No, thank you, Kim. Uh, it's uh, just to I agree with everything that uh, Aristotle was just saying. A couple things that I would add are the, the, uh, the significance of the Great and Holy Council of Crete in the year 2016. Um, the documents and the, the efforts leading up to that council, which was the the plan the the first pan orthodox council in modern history we could say, and uh, the events the the preparations leading up to that council um, provided the themes and much of the content of course of the council itself, and the document the social ethos text for the life of the world 
began a year after the Great and Holy Council of Crete. So it was really, it was in the summer, I believe it was June, almost precisely a year after the council, that, um, <clears throat> that the request was made, the invitation was made to form a special commission of scholars to, uh, to begin preparing this document that would respond to the current issues of the world from a distinctively orthodox perspective, and, and I would even say from a distinctively, uh, in a way that reflects the distinctive spirit of the ecumenical patriarchate. Um, so, so that the events of, of 2016 were really a very significant, played a very significant role in the production of this text. And, uh, and then once that commission was formed, you know, we began talking about the themes that we could cover, the setting the scope, trying to determine a framework, uh, and very significantly, as, as Father John mentioned in his preliminary comments, sending invitations out to the hierarchs of all of the local churches under the um, spiritual care of the ecumenical patriarch to solicit input on what are the issues on the ground, what are the pastoral issues on the ground with which they're struggling in their daily lives. And having that input then fed up, and I think more than, more than two dozen uh, uh, church, local churches responded with feedback that the commission then was able to incorporate into our drafting. And then once the document was fully drafted and reviewed by the whole commission, it was presented to the Holy Synod, the Holy and Sacred Synod of the Ecumenical Patriarchate for, um, for endorsement. And that makes it a very special kind of document. It wasn't written by the Synod, uh, but it was endorsed by the, by the Synod. And that's um, something much more than just a you know, an edited volume by a bunch of scholars or something, yes. I hope we get to that as we continue this discussion because of course the Catholic Church has just embarked on Synod 2021, 20, 23, where we're entering this process and we have so much to learn and love to hear more about that as we move forward. Mm -hmm. I guess our next topic of conversation is really to drill down into what themes of Catholic social thought uh, and this document share with share in common, what are different points of emphasis. Uh, and I have so much to learn from the folks I'm sharing the status with, but I'd like to sort of start maybe by framing that a little bit and then turn to David to give us some more specific points of emphasis. Um, it seems to me, and again, coming at this as a Catholic, it seems to me as a general frame, it shares with Catholic social thought in particular, as seen through the lens of Pope Francis, a similar answer to the question, how are we to be in the world, right? That's what I see when I read it. It offers an approach to the public sphere rooted in an ethos of openness and engagement. And as I reflected on it, I was put in mind of words of Marilyn Robinson, an American Christian novelist and essayist, who wrote a very well-regarded uh, essay in 2013 called Christianity, Ethos, Not Identity. And she said, she called out the warping of the Christian faith that results when people use Christianity as an identity badge rather than living it as an ethos, a way of being in the world. Um, to me, this is something that Pope Francis has been challenging as well. This idea of how we are to be in the world describes something on offer from the Catholic social tradition. And of course, in Evangelii Gaudium, Pope Francis says this in a very, very well-known way. He says, I prefer a church which is bruised, hurting, and dirty because it's been out on the streets rather than one which is unhealthy because it's confined and clinging to its own security. He says, we don't need to fear going astray. We need to be fear remaining shut up in structures. And he talks about a field hospital after battle. He's of course talked about this after COVID uh, in 2020 as well as this document with Fratelli Tutti, um, where he offered a vision of a church that is a common home. It's not a fortress, it's a home with open doors, he said. Um, and I see that when I read this document as well, uh, to me, it was so interesting to see that posture of engagement, that posture of openness to the broader world, and especially the centering of the poor and the least of these. At virtually every turn in the document, you see that, right? The poor and the least of these front and center. Um, and in particular in the section on the church in the public sphere, I felt like it really talked about the church being open and not fearful, um, living in peaceful coexistence and getting the benefits of modern society. So that's the frame in which I see it. And I wonder, David, if you might point out particular commonalities that you see as well and maybe different points of emphasis. Thank you, Kim, I'd be glad to. Uh, there are numerous points where one could discuss the overlap and similarities between uh, this document on For the Life of the World from the Orthodox Community and Catholic Social Thought. And let me just pick out one or two to start our conversation. Uh, it strikes me uh, right from the start 
in addition to the point that Kim makes about both documents having a very uh, strong orientation toward open dialogue with the world, that both uh, the Catholic social tradition and the For the Life of the World document have a deep commitment to the essentially social mission of the church, that the church has a commitment to the larger society and to the social life that binds people together in community with each other. Uh, the Orthodox uh, document puts it this way. It says, the Orthodox Church has long nurtured within itself a strong and distinctive social instinct. And it goes on to say that that social instinct, the idea that human beings are only human in interaction, in relation with each other, is founded on the very Trinitarian life of God, the binding together of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a God of social relationship, a God of shared love. And the document uh, that you have produced quotes uh, Callistos on that and goes further in many other ways. It goes further to say, for example, the fact that human beings are created in the image and likeness of God is stressed again in a social way. We are God's images, image since we are the image of a Trinitarian relational God in that we are destined for free and conscious communion with God and communion with our neighbor. These are very powerful statements. Indeed, uh, it goes further and gets more concrete and says, this has very important implications for our social ethic and an ethic committed to the advancement of the common good, a good that we share together, that a good of our inner relationship with each other. And the orthodox statement says this, without the understanding of the common good as the center of social life, democratic pluralism itself all too easily degenerates into pure individualism, free market absolutism, and spiritually corrosive consumerism. So this, this social nature of the person is very central. This is echoed in numerous statements coming out of the Catholic social tradition. For example, the Second Vatican Council of the Roman Catholic Church in its document, The Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World, says this, God did not create the human being as a solitary, but by his inmost nature, human beings are social beings. And unless they relate themselves to others, they can neither live nor develop their potential. That social nature of the person is, is echoed again. And the Catholic tradition through Thomas Aquinas, drawing upon Aristotle, uh, tells us that the central norm of social life is justice, and that justice is a commitment to the common good, the good we share together. So this notion that the, so the common good and the social nation or nature of the person uh, is central to our life together is common to both the Orthodox and the Roman Catholic tradition, as both of these documents make very clear. One last point I'll make before we pursue to some other issues. It's very interesting that some contemporary authors in the United States, for example, John Rawls, the late John Rawls, would want to argue that this notion of the common good is dangerous because it denies human freedom. It leads to the community oppressing individual freedom. But both the Catholic tradition and the Orthodox tradition make very clear that they're committed to an understanding of the common good that is built upon human freedom, that grows out of freedom. And both traditions have a very strong emphasis on the importance of religious freedom in particular. And the For the Life of the World document has a lengthy session, section discussing religious freedom and the need to respect the freedom of those who are different. This is a central commitment, and this is clearly a major commitment of Pope Francis as well, as it was of the Second Vatican Council in its Declaration on Religious Freedom, uh, which was drafted by one of my mentors, John Courtney Murray, 
uh, a great American theologian who helped make the American contribution uh, to this notion of religious freedom. It'd be interesting to know how much the emphasis on religious freedom you think came from the Orthodox Church in the Americas uh, to this kind of emphasis on religious freedom. So that we well, can proceed like to, in that other areas. Then. Sure, I'd love to. I'd love to sort of build on that and ask you. Let's start with you, Telly. Your your understanding of the common emphases and then maybe different points of emphases. But I'd also love to hear more in particular about this idea of the common good because it's such an evocative phrase in the document, right? Symphonia, and maybe I'm. I hope I'm getting that right. But but that idea of how how your tradition describes the common good. And also, in particular, what David alluded to, not using that as the source of a false nationalism, you know, sort of a product, the drive violence or anything like that. Well, I mean, to be honest, I mean, <laughs> the, again, the Orthodox Church hasn't really reflected on the notion of the common good, right? I mean, it doesn't really have a lot of, um, we had this idea of symphonia, and it can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. Uh, but again, uh, we, we just we really have to remind ourselves that you know 400 years of the Ottoman takeover of or, or pretty much most of Orthodoxy didn't really allow for uh, Orthodoxy to kind of grapple with kinds of issues that uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, were possible, let's say within within the West, within Western Europe, within the Protestant Catholic tradition. I remember my own mentor David Tracy saying to me, and I, I don't, I'm still sort of grappling with what he means by this, but. He did say, he said, you know, the Orthodox never really went through the traditional sort of uh, Renaissance, Enlightenment, uh, Romanticism, idealism, all that kind of stuff, right? Now, he did say, um, <laughs> he did say, and perhaps you have an advantage. And I said, uh, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, maybe you know what it means to think like a tradition. And I'm still sort of grappling with that a little bit because I think that we're, that's, we're struggling to what it means to think like a tradition. And we are countering we really are countering questions that really we haven't been able to uh, counter fully. Now, I'm not going to say for the first time because there was a very rich tradition in 19th century and early 20th century Russia, which was actually really grappling with many of these questions that were in the social document. There was no social document, no social ethos. But there was a very vibrant discussion in 19th and 20th century Russia about many of these things, right? And to some extent, the document draws, uh, is inspired by, draws off of many of the ideas um, uh, that were articulated within that particular uh, period. So when we say, like, circling back to your question, like, <laughs> what do the Orthodox say about the common book? I think we're still figuring that out, right? I mean, I think uh, one of the things that the document is meant to point to is that um, uh, perhaps that, w you know, whatever local Orthodox statements are saying about the common good, that's not it. Perhaps, uh, you know, that, that this is a, a, a more consistent theological articulation uh, but by consistent, I mean more consistent with what we identify as the core. And one of the things that the document really advances is this idea of theosis and deification, becoming godlike. And, uh, you know, that has all kinds of connotations, you know, becoming Zeus or Thor. But it's really meant to be in the image and likeness of God, to become more loving. And ultimately, the document wants to say that this particular idea is not just simply for monks or people in the desert, but it's for everyone and it has social ramifications. And I honestly believe, without, he doesn't necessarily use the word all the time, but I actually think that's what Pope Francis is trying to do. I mean, he's trying to orient, I think, Catholic social, social teaching towards that way of being in the world and the fact that it has these particular kinds of social implications and social. So if, I think, again, with the common good, I think what we're at least grappling towards in this particular document is, at the very least, that whatever uh, common good is, that we have to do it in dialogue with people who are different than us, people who don't necessarily believe what we believe, and we're not going to define what the common good is. I mean, we might point to what we think it is, but in the end, we're, we're opening up for conversation with others. We're affirming that there is a common good. We're signaling, to some extent, what we think that might look like, but we also are giving this as a form of conversation, in other words, opening conversation with others because we have to figure that out together. Right? That's what common good is, common. We have to figure that out together in dialogue with people who are, uh, also don't believe what we believe. I saw that very much as a commonality in the document, right? That the language of common good and a moral vocabulary has to be part of our public sphere, has to be part of public life, and we have to be engaged in those conversations with those who disagree with us. And certainly that's where Pope Francis is, is taking our social tradition as well. Perry, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, either on this specific issue or more broadly points of emphasis and points of uh, commonality. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, again, I, th I think there's a lot that could be said here. Uh, one thing that I'll, I'll start with is just that, uh, you know, building off of Aristotle's comment, the fact that the Orthodox Church did not have a long tradition of, of you know, like the Catholic social thought tradition, um, means that in, in ways that are, I think there's a very interesting parallel between our, uh, our revival of our conciliarity in the, ho in the holding and the event of the Great and Holy Council of 2016. That I heard described uh, as a kind of exercising our conciliar muscles again after many years of not exercising them. And, you know, as most of us know, in our own lives, when we try to exercise muscles that we haven't used for a while, it can be, it can be painful. We can be sore afterwards. Things don't go as well as, as we may have wanted. Um, and I think it's fair to say, and this is not a criticism, it's just a statement of fact, that the documents that came out of that council are not as detailed, they're not as developed as uh, maybe some were hoping for or expecting, and certainly much less so than what oftentimes comes out of the Roman Catholic tradition. Um, but I, and I think the same is true for this document. This is the first time that the Ecumenical Patriarchate has endorsed a document like this. It's not going to be perfect. It doesn't. Tr it doesn't claim to be anywhere near that. It is a an invitation to start engaging deeply with these social issues. It's not the last word, it's, it's the invitation to begin speaking. And I think that's, a, that's a, an essential point to make. Um, just a couple quick, quick other, other points. First of all, the liturgical framing of the document, I believe, is very significant. And, uh, and we see this a little bit, even in the reference to Laudato Si, is there's, you know, it comes from a canticle, right? It comes from a prayer. But it's not really developed through the rest of the encyclical as a kind of liturgical theme or structure. Whereas for the life of the world is structured through specific excerpts from the liturgical tradition, whether they are prayers from the divine liturgy or petitions or um, you know, references to uh, other components within the, the, the prayer, the common, the liturgical life of the church. I think that's very significant. I think, it, I think it's part of the brilliance, frankly, of the document. And it is a difference, right? We see a lot more in the Roman Catholic uh, encyclical tradition, we see a lot more reference to things like, you know, the natural divine order, uh, the, the structure or the, the, the um, you know, harmonizing with the natural order, uh, you know, this kind of natural law tradition, which is a brilliant and rich tradition, but it has a slightly different spirit to it than a more liturgical approach, I would say. So I think that those are some, some points that I would highlight. Um, and I think also just the, the you know, there's, you're not going to get the kind of detailed development, whether it's with respect to the concept of the common good or whether it's re with respect to concepts like subsidiarity or others that, you know, we, we're, this text is not going to give you uh, a deep exegesis of a particular chapter of scripture uh, in the way that we find in some, some Catholic encyclicals, right? But it is, it is beginning that effort, and I think that's part of its brilliance, too. Can I just follow up on that uh, before we get to talking about Ukraine in particular? Mm -hmm. um, just to ask that, you know, you talk about exercising conciliar muscles, and I feel like the muscles that we're starting to exercise are synodal muscles. And of course, the Catholic tradition, you know, Latin America has a great experience with synodality, and, and our religious orders have some experience with it in other parts of the world as well. But certainly here in the U.S., for instance, mm -hmm. other than the Encuentro process, we don't have as much as we would like. I'd love to sort of learn from you what this particular process was like. Um, what you what was you know what was positive? What can we learn from it? With respect to the text, or <laughs> yeah, with, with respect, respect to the, to the council? Text, with yeah. respect to the text, or negative. <laughs> well, you want me to say? You want to go ahead? And tell you. <laughs> no, I. You know, I, I. This is maybe I don't know. Um, I have to be mindful that we're being recorded, I guess. But I think um, uh, you know I, I appreciate how much the Roman Catholic Church and Roman Catholic theologians and scholars and bishops say how much they can learn from us, but I would not idealize our conciliar process. I would de idealize conciliarity. Okay. I would idealize, so all of us together need to push for conciliarity, but um, I would just simply not um, 
I'd be careful about that because our conciliar structures, our theology of synodality, our theology of conciliarity is wonderful and it points to what we need to strive for. Um, and that's, that's good, um, but we are very far from realizing how it should be. And most importantly, I, I quite honestly, I think in the sense of representation, right? I mean, the conciliar process is limited to the bishops and it shouldn't be. Um, and I think that they do not have, there's not adequate representation globally. So anyway, I could go on and on, and I, and I, I but the thing is this, I, I will say this, I will say this, is that, again, one of the signals here of, uh, one, of the, one of the importance of the document is that, in fact, um, uh, conciliatory didn't work perfectly, but it kind of pointed, it worked, it, it worked better than it usually does, I would say. And one of the ways that it did is that, um, it really was a great privilege that His uh, Hol Holiness said, look, I mean, gather uh, theologians and have them be representative as much as possible and bring them together, have discussion. We worked well together. There was a sense of it going to, to and fro with the bishops and having others comment and so on and so forth. So I will say this, that this document is the result of, uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, a, a kind of conciliary that wasn't perfect, but probably work better than it usually does within the Orthodox Church. And that's so. what I was reacting yeah. to, the sort yeah. of lay consultation. Yeah. David, do you have any reaction to all that? Yeah. One, one point I would like to make, and this goes back to the discussion about the common good, um, and to Perry's comment about the liturgical invocations that run throughout the entire, the entire document. It seems to me that that liturgical emphasis that runs through the document echoes the orthodox sensibility about how liturgy and our liturgical life together is where we enter fully into the life of God, where theosis, divinization, becoming godlike actually becomes visible in some way. But the interesting thing about this passage, this document that you've worked on, is that it talks about that process of becoming godlike as having relevance to the larger society that we live in. What would it mean for our society, our social life, to become somehow more godlike? Uh, and that's, it invokes a kind of powerful, beautiful image of human beings drawn together in love with each other and with God. Now, the the interesting thing that Roman, and that's the theological emphasis that I find so moving in this document. How then to translate that into the larger secular discourse and so forth? That's where Roman Catholic thought has drawn upon natural law tradition, using Thomas Aquinas and drawing upon Aristotle, not so much Aristotle Papanikolaou, but Aristotle the original one um, back in Greece. Uh, drawing upon Aristotle's idea that our life together should be marked by what Aristotle calls in Greek, to koinon, the common. The, the, we should be together uh, in living out our life in the polis. And um, if you can bring that secular notion of the common life we share together, together with these deeper theological understandings of theosis or of becoming more godlike, you've got a, a beautiful way of synthesizing Christian theological and secular political ideas in a way that uh, I think gives the church a real powerful driving force to address these issues. So that's something that I found very moving in reading the document. Very well said, and I agree with that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And now I know some, the issue that's on everybody's mind really is, is the, inv the invasion of Ukraine. And I'd love to talk about uh, what this document has to say about peace and security and, and, and all the issues that might help us think about a proper response to what's going on right now. Telly, can we start with you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave peace and security to uh, Father Perry because, I mean, those are his areas. And, um, and he also quoted a book on orthodox perspectives of war on war, um, which I think is very relevant also to, the, to, to the, obviously the current situation. Uh, I think I want to speak a little bit more about, uh, very briefly, and probably uh, uh, on, uh, in a way that is probably most, uh, is, is, is fairly evident to everybody, 
but on issues of um, this idea of uh, religious nationalism. And I mean, one of the things that the document uh, really tries to bring home in some sense is its unequivocal support for democracy. Uh, now, uh, you know, it, it does, I think, you know, it, we speak about it in terms of liberal democracy, right? And, and you know, there's various ways in which that can be um, finessed or interpreted or talked about. I mean, one of the criticisms of the document is that it is liberal. Uh, I don't think that's true, but that could be for another discussion. Um, but it, it's unequivocal support for liberal democracy in the sense of affirming sort of basic principles of freedom and equality, right? To some extent, uh, in many ways, as um, Jose Casanova, who will be up here in, a, in, a, in, in, in the next session, um, this idea of this balance between sort of the free exercise and the establishment clause and that ongoing tension. So, um, so the document is unequivocally in support of that. Uh, it's unequivocally in support of Orthodox churches, uh, um, institutionally and Christians trying to figure out to be in the world in such a way as to facilitate that, promote it, uh, even if it means to some extent um, uh, speaking about a common good in such a way that often doesn't necessarily reflect very strictly the reality or the morality, I would say, within sort of the, the Orthodox Church itself, right? So, um, and, and I think, you know, in a sense, um, it, its relevance to some extent uh, to this particular situation is that what we're seeing on full display <laughs> is, a, is a kind of rejection of that, a kind of religious nationalism that in many ways is canceling out the other, a kind of uh, a religious nationalism that to some extent is really uh, canceling out uh, maybe this is a little bit too strong, but to some extent rejecting uh, a particular forms of diversity. Um, and uh, so I, that, I mean, so I guess I, in, my, in my estimation, uh, and maybe I'm not in a position to say this because I'm, I'm, I, I was involved in drafting it, but it's somewhat prophetic, I think, in relationship to the situation. Uh, and, and actually, there ha I have received, I have received communications from some people within Ukraine uh, kind of pointing to the document, and but also pointing to it in such a way also in terms of uh, themes that now uh, Father Perry will speak about, just but what does it speak about in terms of war and peace and other things, right? And so to some extent the, the document is, is, it's good that it came out when it did. No one could have really predicted what is happening now. And it, it makes the conversation, it, it, it's, it makes its relevancy, its timelessness, uh, it, it makes it even more timely document, right? Yeah. Can I just follow up before we get to this on yeah. that? Just a for brief follow up. Um, I've heard you say another context in, in this context, describing what's going on, uh, but on a, a podcast about this, saying that real wars begin with culture wars, and talking about the internationalization <laughs> of a culture war here. You know, how do you think that affects what's going on? So I, I must uh, admit that I ripped that off from um, uh, James Hunter, right? Because uh, he's the one who said that at a session that we were together with Christina and Jose, who were. Uh, in Vienna in 2019, and uh, so I should have attributed it to him. So I, w I am doing that now uh, in, in terms of, <laughs> I'm, I'm footnoting him now. So um, uh, I, I do think, um, and, uh, and, and, and you'll hear in the next session too, uh, um, uh, some of the great work that was done sort of identifying sort of the language of traditional values and how that was being appropriated by the Russian Orthodox Church, by Putin himself, and and, uh, and, and ultimately leading to a certain kind of globalized uh, culture war. So that will be, I think, uh, uh, prominent in the next session, so I won't speak to that specifically. But um, it, is, it is frightening to think that, um, that, that all that preceded what's, what's happening now. Uh, and so uh, we just, I guess, it's, we just need to be aware of that. And I think one of the things the document, I, I do think one of the things that document, culture wars are polarizations. Mm -hmm. I think the document tries to cut through polarizations, right? It tries to move through uh, and cut through polarizations, and I think that's one of the important contributions of the document. And it also gives an alternate vision, perhaps, of how the Orthodox might respond to um, um, these particular kinds of questions, other than that that we're seeing now, especially in the Russian space. And very much what Pope Francis is trying to do right. in Fratelli Tutti and a better, better kind of politics, the section on that. Perry, let's go to you. Can you talk a little bit about sort of the sections on peace and security and what we can draw from the document there? Sure. Um, you know, again, this is, uh, I think there are only about three to four pages in the entire text that are dedicated 
to questions of war and peace. So this is not a, an extended treatment. It's not intended to be a comprehensive or exhaustive discussion of the ethics of, of war and peace. Um, but, it, but it, again, as, as Aristotle suggested, there are dimensions to this that are just at least prescient, if not prophetic, right? And that's, and that's uh, part of what we've certainly, what we're seeing every day continuously in this horrifically tragic situation. In, in Ukraine. I'll just quote one part from uh, paragraph 42 of For the Life of the World. Nothing is more contrary to God's will for creatures fashioned in his image and likeness than violence one against another, and nothing more sacrilege than the organized practice of mass killing. And in the next section, the text uses this important phrase to say, that violence is sin par excellence. And I think that there was some pushback on that, that phrase when the document was published uh, and some, critical, some articles that have come out or will be coming out in the months ahead in various scholarly journals, you know, take the authors to task to a little bit on that specific claim. But I don't think there's one person in the room today that would say that, that that claim is untrue, right? We are seeing it. Violence is sin par excellence. And um, so, uh, and, and this is all being framed within the context of an understanding of the significance of the human person created in the divine image and likeness, something that we share, of course, with much of the Roman Catholic social thought tradition. Um, and and uh, that being the grounding, not simply for rights and human rights, which maybe some of the next panel will address more in a more sustained manner, but understanding the inescapable, inescapably tragic nature of war no matter what, no matter which side you're on, no matter what role you play, war affects everyone. It does damage to everyone. It does, it does damage to uh, those who are suffering, of course, those who lose their lives, their homes, who are refugees, of course. Uh, but it does damage to the soldiers. It does, does damage to the citizens. It does, dam does damage to the environment. I mean, uh, Dr. Walashak, who's here, can speak to the, the horrific situation with the release of radiation now that's happening in Ukraine as a result of this. So, so I think that's another important point. And, and the text makes it very clear that this is not just a fratricidal war because it is Slavs against Slavs. It's not a fratricidal war because it's the nation with the largest population of Orthodox Christians killing citizens of the nation with the second largest population of Orthodox Christians. It is a fratricidal war because every single war is fratricidal, because every single person is our sister or brother. And our brother, as St. Siloan the Athenite says, our brother is our life. Our brother and our sister is the very ground for our existence. We are killing ourselves as we kill others. David, I wonder if you could pick up on this, issues of peace and security in Ukraine. But I also, you mentioned religious freedom earlier. Archbishop Guziak was at our, our initiative dialogue earlier uh, last week on the war in Ukraine, and he talked about the just sort of how much um, religious freedom is just being decimated or will be decimated in Ukraine. Uh, in the wake of all of this. So could you talk about that situation? Well, let me just build upon uh, the quote that Perry just made, uh, the quotation that about the condemnation of violence, that it's the very quotation that I have at the top of my notes about in the <laughs> section on war. Uh, it's a very powerful statement about organized violence being sacrilegious. And uh, there's a further discussion that's related to the religious liberty issue but it goes further, it's, uh, and it's the section uh, that in the document of For the Life of the World that condemns what um, is called philatism. Mm. Uh, and this is a, a Greek word that has the meaning that somehow the religious tradition is identified with a particular strand of ethnicity or national, national identity of a subordination of religion to a national community. And the, the statement uh, for the life of the world in number 11 says this, thus it was that the Council of Constantinople, 
in 1872 condemned philatism, which is to say the subordination of the orthodox faith to ethnic identities and national interests. To subordinate orthodox faith, Christian faith, or you might go even as far as to say any religious faith being subordinated to national or ethnic identity is an abuse because it reduces God to something that's below our human relationships. It it's a, it's, therefore is sacrilegious. And this is the sort of thing that's lying behind at least some of the justifications that have been offered for what Putin is doing in Ukraine, a kind of religious identification of orthodoxy with the expansion of the Russian world, Ruskimir. Uh, and I know that the statement that has come from the Fordham Center, and I don't know whether uh, on the uh, condemnation of the Ruskimir ideology and the Russian world ideology has been a very powerful theological extrapolation from this kind of comment in the, uh, in the statement that we're discussing. And it's very relevant then to saying, no, you can't subordinate Christianity to any national identity. People, people's belief has to be free. It can't be coerced through the force of a government. And therefore, people should be free, politically free, to have a civil right to religious freedom no matter where they are. And that doesn't mean that every belief is equally, equally good, but it does mean that people should have the freedom to pursue their faith as they see best according to their own lights, uh, and that no state should try to control that. And that's where I think we've got a very powerful invocation here of both the religious freedom argument and the condemnation of nationalism uh, in a way that are both relevant to what's going on in Ukraine today. At least that's the way I read it. I'd love to shift to questions from the audience, but first, before we do that, let me just ask one last question uh, here as we talk about, we heard, uh, we heard in opening comments, in your opening comments, uh, that we would talk that there's a very, there's dissension in Orthodox churches among, about condemning the war in Ukraine. What's your reaction to that? Uh, Perry, let's start with you on that. You know, what do you, is there any sense in which the social ethos developed here um, is in some way could bring people together or are those forces of nationalism and other forces too strong? Gosh, I mean, it's a really hard question. I mean, I think, you know, for many of us, it just seems so obvious, the immorality and the evil, if not the demonic character of, of this war. Um, and at the same time, you know, there are people who, who see it very differently, whether it's, in, whether it's in terms of the culture war kind of angle, that this is somehow uh, protecting or preserving traditional values against you know, the excesses of Western liberalism, or, uh, or whether um, it's being interpreted uh, um, as somehow uh, justified on more political or uh, historical grounds. Um, but I, I just, I, I have to say, I'm personally just disgusted with the lack of prophetic voice of many of the churches, many of the Orthodox churches. And, um, you know, I, I think if we are not able to stand up and recognize that this is utterly incompatible with what it means to be an Orthodox Christian, we know nothing. Um, and, and if I could just add a word of caution here, <laughs> um, and I uh, and I may be I may be uh, criticized for this, which I, is fine. Um, <laughs> but I, I sometimes recently I've been hearing a lot of um, a lot of interviews in the media people uh, who are either public officials of Ukraine or others will, will end their comments with glory to Ukraine. And I just think that that's, I understand, but I think it's a bit dangerous um, because we don't want this to turn into, you know, just the reversal of what is happening on the Russian side, right? We need to be able to transcend, uh, we need to be able to move beyond these nationalist impulses um, and, and this is certainly true for us as Americans, uh, but, but it is a constant temptation to idolatry, as Father David was saying very beautifully. Glory to God. Glory to God, but certainly not while we're engaged in, in this activity, yeah, right? right? Exactly. But, I mean, but only God, not, not Ukraine exactly. or Russia. Exactly. Yeah. So. How about you, Sally? Um, 
I, I, the response of the Orthodox churches, I mean, uh, I mean, one of the things that we're learning is that, you know, religion is playing a geopolitical role. And we just have to be aware of that. And it's playing a geopolitical role within the Orthodox space. So one of the reasons why some of the Orthodox bishops in various spaces uh, have not um, exercised their independence uh, if they wanted to, we're not even clear if that's the case, but maybe they do and, they, and they're not able to, is because um, they, they have so cornered themselves, again, after the communists of the fall of communism into this kind of uh, nationalist sort of orthodoxy within their own particular space that they have given themselves little wiggle room to be an independent voice. They have to coordinate with the government. They have to, they have to consider kind of the geopolitical relationship with Russia. And, uh, and that, that plays a very, that, 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 has, that is very much playing a very big role in terms of how uh, some, of the, some of the bishops are, are sort of um, coordinating their response. And I guess all this to say, a first of all, for us to be aware of that, right? Because I do think sometimes, even in, even in some of the media, uh, it's just shocking to me in many ways how um, they're not reporting about religion at all <laughs> in terms of the conflict. I mean, it's really quite quite shocking. I mean, I mean, there's been a little bit more than usual, which has been very good, but it's also the case that it's quite shocking how it's been absent uh, in in many of the media portrayals, right? So, I mean, but in terms of the Orthodox world. Again, uh, and I've been, I've been saying this for a very long time, all this um, uh, magnifies the importance of a transnational symbol, right? A transnational, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, institutional infrastructure, right? Some kind of, uh, there, there's some kind of transnational point <laughs> that we need to point to that would constantly remind us that orthodoxy is beyond these particular kinds of national interests, right? And, and, and the document is, is out there as, as a kind of trans, in my opinion, a transnational kind of document. And now whether the other orthodox churches see it that way and so on and so forth is, is another story, but it is a, a transnational uh, a proclamation of the orthodox ethos. And uh, yeah, and, and, and I, I just, uh, regardless of, not with, I mean, regardless of how the other Orthodox churches see it, I mean, it, it's out there, and thank God it's out there because it's at least a prophetic witness for uh, a different way of, of thinking and living uh, Orthodox, uh, the Orthodox faith. Sure. David, speaking of a transnational figure, as, what's the role of the church here? What's the role of Pope Francis? Well, I think Pope Francis has been quite strong on certain levels of responding to the war in Ukraine. He went directly to the Russian embassy to the Vatican himself. He didn't call the ambassador to visit him. He went and saw him to try to plead for some kind of prevention of this war. Uh, he has made some very strong statements yesterday about what happened in Bucha uh, and condemning that as an abomination. He's been cautious, however, in not naming Putin and in not specifically getting into discussions about the Moscow Patriarchate and so forth. It's a temptation, it seems to me, to put ecumenism and concern for peace on some kind of scale and weigh which one is more important. It seems to me in the current situation, mm -hmm. risks have to be taken, especially risks that may have ecumenically negative consequences for the relation between the papacy and the, and the Moscow Patriarchate. At least that would be my reading of the situation. Uh, but Pope Francis has taken some steps here that have been good, but going back to what Father Chris Obvious was saying, I'm not sure that he's gone far enough either. And uh, so I would like to see a little more. We also should remember, though, that this subordination of religion to national identity that I think is happening in Russia, it's not unknown to us Catholics and Protestants in the West either. Yeah, yeah. It certainly happened during the Second World War with the so-called Reichskirche in Germany. And it's uh, happening in the United States today. It is, indeed. I mean, it's, and, it's, uh, it's really a yeah. phenomenon throughout the whole world. And when, you, when I speak to my own students about it, I mean, uh, it, you know, it, it was obviously simmering in the United States, and now it's on full. <laughs> now it's like it, it's, it's there and kind of it's, 
I was, you know, it, it's, it's out there. Everybody's seeing it now. And I think that we just have to now uh, uh, see this as a kind of global issue that we have to confront and, and speak about. Absolutely. I couldn't them. agree more. Couldn't agree more myself. Let's open it to questions from you all. First, I'll start with you, John. John Borelli. Thank you. Uh, one of the things old hands in church affairs and ecumenism do is read texts such as For the Life of the World. And we all have our own methodology. And I have a question on methodology. After a perusal, I quickly turn to the notes. You have 63. Now, you have a lot of internal references, and that's very insightful on the liturgical framework that, uh, aspect of this document. But a lot of internal references to scripture. But nearly all 63 quotes or footnotes are, or in notes are to the fathers of the church. By contrast, if we take Rerum Navarum as sort of a beginning point in Catholic social teaching, there were 41 uh, references, some internal references to uh, scripture, but most of the 41 notes were to scripture, and the bulk of the non-scriptural notes were to Thomas Aquinas, with one to Gregory the Great and one to Tertullian. And if we take Centesimus Annus 100 years later, 1991, John Paul II had 91 notes, and only one was to a previous a, 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 a source prior to 1891, and that was to Irenaeus. Irenaeus, your document quotes several times. So my question is this: considering this as a, as Father John described it, as a sort of beginning, an effort. Do you see your methodology going through some kind of change as you go along as far as drawing references beyond the patristic tradition, which is always there? Yeah, um, I, I can say a quick word. I think, uh, uh, first of all, it's always, I, I agree with your approach. I think it's a, it's a very helpful, illuminative lens to look at which sources are being regarded as authoritative, right? Um, and uh, I, I think that there are a couple of references in For the Life of the World to documents from the Council in Crete, um, which, again, we have a limited number of earlier texts. Uh, it's very different in that respect from recent encyclicals from the Vatican. But I think that also part of what Part of what I will say is that we didn't sit down as a commission and say, okay, we need to have three quotes from this church father and five quotes from this, and there's too many quotes from this person and not enough quotes from that person. That's not how we worked. We just, we worked organically. And there has been some criticism. Why does one person get quoted twice and someone else only once? Or, you know, things like this. And I think that that's, um, you know, there, there is, I, I appreciate the way that we, that we worked on it as a team and um, didn't, didn't get hyper-focused on distribution of references. Um, I think that scripture is by far the most frequently cited uh, source. And even in the, the notes, I don't think all the scriptural references are, are identified. <laughs> so, um, so there's even more scripture there than if you were to just count the margins or however you want to say. So um, uh, that's, that's my response, but thank you. It's a great, great point to bring up. Go ahead. Dennis Bradley. I am curious to know uh, how many Russian theologians cooperated in the document that you're referring to. And the reason I ask that is about the year 2000, when the Russian church had issued their social document. Tristan Manglehart, formerly a colleague here at Georgetown, and I uh, were the co-chairman and co-sponsors of a meeting of uh, theologians and philosophers in Italy, sponsored by the Bradley Foundation of all things. Um, and I had been in Russia recently before that, and I had made a very long, complicated argument with the then Metropolitan, who is now the Patriarch, Kirill, 
why Hilary and Althea should be allowed to come to this conference. It was a time I still had great confidence and affection for Metropolitan Hilarion. And I really had to argue with Kirill to get him to come to the conference, to let him come. And he did. Uh, what was very interesting at the time, this is about the year 2000, it was very clear that the Russians were putting a spin on their own document and that Hilarion and uh, Tristram got into a lot of headbutting at the conference and about the interpretation of the Russian church's document. I would say even then, the Russian church was certainly not wanting a liberal interpretation of their church document. What do you think the relationship between that document and the Ecumenical Patriarch's document is? And were there any real cooperation going on with Russian theologians when you formed that? I don't know myself. Um, so the quick answer to the cooperation part is just no, because um, you know it's a document of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, and not that um, that not that that wouldn't um, um, sort of inspire the Ecumenical Patriarch to 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 perhaps uh, invite. Um, people from other jurisdictions, but it's a kind of a tricky thing. It's a tricky, we, 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 are, we do have these, as you know, we have these, autos, out, uh, these autocephalous churches which are jurisdictionally independent, and given that, it's not quite so easy for an autocephalous hierarch to just simply ask theologians or priests or bishops from other jurisdictions to be a part of a process. So that's, that's one of the challenges of that. Um, I would say the relationship of our document to the, to the con social concept document Look, I've read that document. It's not very good, um, right? I mean, no, I, I, and I mean this to some extent. I'm trying to be descriptive. Um, it is absolutely indicative of a church that has just come out of uh, a, a total, totalitarian regime that has basically tried to um, almost destroy it, uh, uh, which, of course, it didn't. And there's, I know there's different phases of the relationship and so on and so forth, right? I mean, you know, when you, it, this look, I mean, I keep mentioning the Ottomans. I mean, for those particular Orthodox countries that were under the Ottomans, it took them a long time to develop an intellectual tradition. You just can't snap your fingers and all of a sudden have your intellectual tradition kind of snap and, and be at attention, right? Um, the sad thing uh, about what's happening within the, within the Russian Orthodox intellectual tradition is that they absolutely refuse to draw on what is probably one of the greatest heritages of the Orthodox intellectual tradition, which is the 19th and 20th century. I think that, to me, is one of the greatest tragedies, that they absolutely refuse to claim that as their own and to build on it and to think about it and to be defined by it and somehow to be inspired by it. You know, instead, they had this vision of somehow regaining a certain kind of relevance, reconnecting Orthodox and Russian identity, which they actually accomplished, and uh, then backing themselves into a corner and ultimately becoming a department of the state. So that document is weak, and it's filled with all kinds of caricatures um, that I think, uh, uh, you know, it, to some extent, it's just simply not relevant. Uh, the, the, the one thing I will say is that the fact that they did create it, their support of the war is actually in contradiction with that document, Yes. right? Their support of what's emerging really now as a totalitarian regime, a regime, is in contradiction with that document. <laughs> so um, it's, it's almost irrelevant to the Russian Orthodox Church. So um, I don't, you know, again, I, I, there's just, there's need for, there's just need for what's happening the Russian Orthodox stance in relation to the war is the anti-Orthodox ethos. So there needs to be a social ethos of the Orthodox Church that needs to be articulated to kind of call that out. And that's what this document does, right? As well as you know, the voices of many others as well, including the Declaration of Ruskimir, which we did not author, by the way. We have to be clear about that. We used our platform to project it, but the, the credit really should go to 
uh, primarily to Pandalika Ladzidis and uh, Brandon Gallagher and, uh, you know, fa huh? Fa Father Richard Rene and uh, a few others who kind of, um, so they really deserve the credit of initiating that. Uh, we used our platform to project it. So, um, look, I, I, this is going to sound a bit arrogant, and for those who know me, perhaps they won't be surprised. <laughs> but uh, the social ethos document is the best thing out there. It's not perfect, right? But it's the best thing out there that the Orthodox Church has, and that's why I'm grateful for this conversation. And this, it's not perfect. It needs to develop. We need to keep going. But um, it, thank God we did it because it's, time, it's more urgent now than ever, especially given what the Russian Orthodox Church is doing. Thank you, Perry. Do you have a Just a really quick addition to, to the comments of, that, that Aristotle offered, and that is, uh, uh, um, you know, the, the Russian theologians had an opportunity. It was to participate in the Council in Council, in Crete. Yeah. And if they would have participated, then their voice would have been reflected in the documents of that council more directly. And this text, which was an outgrowth of that council, would have potentially been a, a fully pan-Orthodox statement. But unfortunately, they opted out. So it's not a question of not being invited or disinvited. They were fully invited, but chose not to participate. Thank you. Next question. Dominic. Thank you. Um, with the war in Ukraine in mind, um, where is the place for democracy, and what does it look like in both the Catholic and Orthodox social thought traditions? And do they have overlap or differences there, and especially in context of promoting human dignity? David, can we start with you to talk about the Catholic tradition on that, and then maybe move over? Sure. I, I mean, Roman Catholicism, if you look at its history, 2,000 years worth, uh, the relation to democracy has obviously been a recent development. Uh, and there were periods, even in the uh, 1900s uh, and even uh, early 1900s, where there was expressions of doubts about democracy coming from the popes. Uh, but the development since the middle of the 20th century in Catholicism has moved dramatically toward an affirmation of the compatibility of democracy with Christianity. Uh, I think the sign most significant force that led toward that was the experience of the church under the authoritarian regimes of Nazism and Stalinism, where the church recognized that that kind of authoritarianism was contrary to the most fundamental values that the church wanted to affirm. And therefore, you got Pope John XXIII in his encyclical Pacem in Teres in 1963, making a, a broad declaration of human rights, which included the right to self-governance. And, uh, and then the Second Vatican Council picking that up and so forth. Now, there's been an interesting study done um, since the council, done by a man named Sam Huntington, who's the late Samuel Huntington, who was a professor of international politics at Harvard, who was a specialist on the advancement of democracy. And he wrote a book called uh, The Third Wave, which is about three waves of democratization in the world. The first wave being the French and American revolutions. The second wave being what happened after World War II as democracy came to the former Axis powers of Germany, Italy, Japan, and so forth. And then the third wave, he says, began in 1965 and continued into the 1990s. And he said the vast majority of countries that moved to democracy in the third wave were inspired by Catholicism. He attributes it to the Second Vatican Council. Now, there are complicated arguments back and forth about this, and Jose has written about this and so forth. But the point is that the Second Vatican Council made a very significant difference in advancing Catholicism's commitment to democracy. And that has, I think, been continue, continues to be echoed by Pope Francis today uh, in his critiques of nationalism and his critiques of authoritarianism and so forth. So I think, and I think it's rooted in a recognition that the person transcends the state. 
my value as a person is bigger than what the state can control. And therefore, that gives me religious freedom. It gives me freedom to express my views in public. It gives me freedom to try to advance my views of how society ought to be organized, which is all what constitutional democracy is about. So that's a brief summary mm. about my Catholic response on that. Uh, and Perry, do you want to talk about that? That was such an interesting part of this document as well. Would you like to talk a little bit about how it treats democracy? Sure. I mean, uh, uh, you know, others that are on, on the dais and certainly uh, Professors Casanova and, and Stuckel know more about this than than I do, um, but I would I would want to make one point, and that is that uh, in for the life of the world, um, the text is very explicit in saying that it that the Orthodox tradition does not endorse a particular form of government, right? That it that and that's very very important. Um, you know that that we do not prescribe a particular structure for gov for the organization of of human communities. Having said that, I, I believe that's in paragraph eight of the text. And then in the next two paragraphs, it goes on to basically say, having said that, not all forms of government are equal. And some are quite incompatible with what it means to be uh, a Christian or an Orthodox Christian specifically. And, and, and as, as Father David mentioned, that, that's explicitly linked to totalitarian or absolutist types of regimes. Um, I think that's an that's a incredibly important uh, component of the document. Um, the document is uh, very favorably leaning toward democracies, um, and, uh, and I think as, as it ought to. And, and just building on the comment about Pachaman Terrace, I had the opportunity to reread it recently, and I would encourage all of you to go to the end of the document where it's discussing the role of the UN. And it is incredible to read what the per how that text in 1963 interpreted the purpose of the United Nations in light of the comments that President Zelensky made a couple days ago. Uh, so I would encourage you to look at that. Thank you so much. And I think with that, we're going to wrap up. Please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>